Hello, this is Anne McQueen, writer and advisor for McQueen Philanthropic. I'm speaking with you today on behalf of Animating Democracy, a program of Americans for the Arts. I'm working with Animating Democracy to create a series of papers and podcast interviews featuring the stories of grant makers that support arts organizations and artists with the goal of affecting social change. The series hopes to inform, inspire, and activate funders to support arts and cultural activities as a creative strategy to achieve goals such as advancing social justice, building and developing communities, and increasing civic engagement. Today I'm talking with representatives of the Compton Foundation, a family foundation launched in 1949 and now based in San Francisco. The foundation has only recently begun to include the arts as a strategy to advance its core issue areas, based on a new mission statement that they adopted in late 2011. That statement reads, We ignite change. We support transformative leadership and courageous storytelling, inspiring action towards a peaceful, just, sustainable future. Joining me today are Ellen Friedman, Executive Director, who came to the Foundation in 2010, and Jennifer Sokolov, Program Director, who has been with the Foundation since 2003. I'd like to turn first to Jennifer for a bit of Foundation history and grounding in its core issue areas. Jen? The Foundation has its roots in World War II. Founders Dorothy and Randolph Compton launched a charitable trust after they lost one of their sons in the war. Truly horrified by the tragic loss of so many young people, they set up the trust to build the foundations for peace. They believed that world peace would only be possible if the conditions that brought about war could be eliminated. As a result, they focused their funding on the problems of the rapid growth of the human population, the depletion of natural resources due to population growth and increasing consumption levels, the degradation of the environment, and the truly chaotic status of human rights around the world. They began the institution with a global focus on enormous issues. So how did the conversation about the arts begin at the foundation? And and when it started, was there any resistance to the idea of including arts in a portfolio focused on peace? Well, Dorothy and Randolph's granddaughter, Rebecca DiDomenico, has served on the foundation's board for much of her adult life, and she's a working artist. She started introducing the idea of the potential for art to contribute to social and environmental change to the foundation probably more than a decade ago. And over the ensuing years, the foundation has moved increasingly step by step to incorporate her perspective. We first integrated art for social and environmental change into a family grant program. Then we dedicated a small amount of grant funding specifically to this purpose. We next integrated the arts into our issue area grant making, evaluating arts proposals as another methodology to accomplish our goals. And then finally, in our new guidelines, we've explicitly made an institutional commitment to creativity and art for change. Hmm. Um, Ellen, you came to Compton more than 60 years after its launch when the conversation about including the arts had just begun. And as I understand it, you had begun to make some grants in the arts. Um, Did your arrival prompt even more introspection and change, and what led up to the new mission statement? Well, I think probably one of the most important um, uh, things that happened at the same time I arrived was that Rebecca, um, who Jen talked about, also became chair of the board at the same time. And so with a new executive director and a new board chair, the time really was right to reflect on what was working and not working in our program area. We retained a terrific facilitator, um, a man named Scott Peppett, who helped us open up the discussion um, in a way that um, started with people talking about what was inspiring to them at this moment and how they felt the foundation's resources could best be used to move change forward. And um, and I think there was enormous recognition that the foundation had created a fantastic, thoughtful, um, meaningful, and strong program, and that we were not making the degree of change that people really felt was important uh, to respond to the original vision of the foundation. And in that conversation, there was a lot of discussion about the need to touch people's hearts and minds um, in order to make the level of change that we wanted to see, and that the arts were an important um, vehicle to get people to think 
differently about the key questions, the big questions um, facing us at this time in history. Um, and how did the grants that had already been made in the arts in, inform that conversation? Well, I think um, when people looked at the grants that had already been made in the arts, um, that they really saw that they were creating a different kind of conversation. Many of them were um, reaching new audiences. I think about a grant that the foundation had made for a number of years to an organization based in London called Cape Farewell that brings artists and scientists together uh, to learn about climate change. And one of the outcomes of that uh, of a grant that had been made resulted in Ian McCune's book called Solar. And I think when they looked at projects like that that resulted in art, writing, music, et cetera, that, that was aimed at a, a larger audience than, say, um, simply policymakers, um, they felt like those projects had great potential. Um, and, and back to the mission statement, um, did did you do a needs assessment or, or look at what other funders were doing, or or was the the new mission statement more about continuing the vision of the founders and sort of bringing it up to date? Um, I think it started internally. We didn't go through, um, say, a field scan or anything like that. We really um, we we worked internally and recognized. Um, because the foundation had such terrific, strong grantees that had been working in peace, environment, women's reproductive rights for many, many years, but we recognized that we weren't winning um, on each issue that we cared about. Um, the barriers to progress were profound, and when we looked at that question, we said, we need to find a new strategy. We need to try something different. And as a small foundation, this is the, one of the beauties of a small foundation, um, we really had the um, capacity to try something new. And we felt like it was incumbent upon us to do that. Um, the ideas of transformative leadership and courageous storytelling certainly sound new to me. Uh, what what does it mean? What do you mean by that? By those well, I think both of these topics reflect a desire and an um, assessment that we need to do the work of social and environmental change differently than we have been doing it. So in the leadership arena, it um, is about how we work in cross-silo networks, how we develop um, movement thinking that is both theoretical and very practical, that the problems we're facing are deeply complicated and that no one organization is going to be able to solve them alone, that that in order to solve the level of problem that we're facing these days, we have to work both at the internal organizational level and change. We have to work in multiple organizations, um, and we have to, you know, change ourselves and transform our way of working um, in order to bring about the kind of change that we want. We also know from data that stories are the way people learn. And so the creative element that has often been missing from movement work, um, we felt like was really important to put back into the work and, and explicitly support that. So funding things that involve community and relationship building and telling new stories to ourselves in new ways um, is a key part of movement building. And so that kind of assumption is um, core to how we think about transformative leadership and courageous storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, Jen, as program director, you're probably the most directly involved in, in the grant making. Um, how does courageous storytelling translate into a grant to an arts organization? Um, and then and, and how how do arts organizations inspire action towards a peaceful, just, sustainable future? Well, maybe I can give some examples of our current grants here that show a range of the ways that we understand the storytelling field. Um, in my first, we, we actually support one artist directly. Artist Eve Mosher did a project called High Water Line that focuses on making the impact of climate change visible and visceral. And she did this project in New York City in 2007, 
and our grant will help her expand the project from New York City to Miami and to London and grow an online curriculum that will make it accessible to communities everywhere. Can you describe exactly what she's doing? Sure. Her first project, she basically took the maps of sea level rise that were expected to happen in New York City, and she took a chalking machine, and she walked it around New York and drew a blue chalk line everywhere where sea level was expected to go. Um, And both the pattern she left on the ground and the conversations she had in communities um, really were different than for folks who saw simple maps. Um, or for the folks who had read articles about sea level rise. Mm-hmm. That must she have really played out pretty interestingly day. with uh, Hurricane Sandy. Yes, she got a ton of additional attention because her lines seemed awfully prescient in a number of places. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what other kinds of grants are you making? In a second example, um, grantee air traffic control works in a creative industry in a systemic way, serving as a bridge between art and activism. So they work to help musicians discover the best ways to contribute to sustained social and environmental change. Um, And they really understand the depth of the music industry and the pressures that musicians face. Um, And they also understand advocacy and activism, and they can really help folks um, engage for the long term instead of simply playing a benefit concert or something like that. Um, And in a third example, we have funded the creative change gathering posted by Opportunity Agenda, which work to build a network of artists who are interested in working in and with communities um, or on the social and environmental issues of our time so that they really feel like they have peers and colleagues who are doing the same kind of work. So it sounds like you're doing grants that are both um, illustrative of the issue and uh, building the capacity of, of, of the movement, of broader movements. I think that's what we hope. Yeah, good, good. And and in this context, how do you think about impact and evaluation? Well, first I would say that we're really early in our experience of supporting this work in in a very uh, focused and intentional way. And um, because our board it, is um, so um, thoughtful, they they really explicitly said we're in a learning mode. And so um, I, I want to highlight that they've really used the word learning in a very intentional way, and um, and so that is exactly what we're doing. And I think, as Jen outlined, we have three different approaches um, that we've taken, and I think what we'll do is figure out over time which ones are having the most momentum and traction. And I think in order to do that, we've had to adapt our funding process to recognize the importance of and be in a sufficient, honest, engaged dialogue with our grant partners so that we can really learn with them um, about how they're working, um, what they're learning, what difference they see um, happening as a result of their work, um, and and that, that dialogue that we engage with our partners um, it really helps the board in its process to adapt and refine our program over time. And um, I think we really see it as a cycle. We make a grant, we learn about it, we adapt our process, and we keep going. Um, And so we're, as I said, really early in that uh, process, but I I like to think of it as as a learning cycle together with our grant partners. Do you bring those grant partners together a lot? Do you do a lot of convening? We haven't done a lot of convenings. We have done um, one round of convenings where we brought partners together to help us define our guidelines. Um, We have been bringing um, uh, many of our grant partners to meet with our board during their board meetings and, um, you know, have our board members engage directly with them. this spring we'll be doing some site visits at our next board meeting um, so that, you know, the board can really see the work on the ground. Mm-hmm. This seems like very rewarding work. Um, what would you say to another funder who wanted to move into this direction? Dive in. Dive in <laughs> and be open. Be open and take risks. Be willing to take some risks with people who are thinking about the world in new and different ways. 
Great. Thank you, Ellen and Jennifer, uh, for sharing this work. This is uh, really quite interesting. Uh, listeners can learn more at CompTonFoundation.org. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's also more information about Compton and other foundations' grant making in the arts on the Animating Democracy website at AnimatingDemocracy.org. The site also features a number of other resources, including papers about evaluation, a directory of other funders doing this kind of work, and the influential report, Trend or Tipping Point, Arts and Social Change Grant Making. Thank you for listening.